Okay, so this week we're going to go ahead and continue in our series on uh, curses and blessings and uh, going through the books of Judges and Ruth. And uh, the whole idea is to kind of look at how uh, Judges is this story of all these failures of, uh, of Israel and Ruth is uh, this wonderful story of people doing what they're supposed to be doing uh, and how that uh, kind of is similar to how the people... Uh, arrive in the promised land, and they're supposed to uh, uh, call on each other, the, the blessings that will happen if they obey God, as well as the uh, curses that are going to fall on them if they don't obey Him. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we'll let you guys get opened up to uh, Judges chapter 7. That's where we'll be reading from uh, for this week. Uh, and then while you guys uh, get to Judges 7, we'll kind of review real quick. So we started off by saying that God's people arrive in the promised land uh, only to reject God uh, by being just too afraid to actually take the land. Uh, you know, they, they first arrived in the promised land and they were too scared to uh, uh, enter into the promised land when they were in the desert. And now they're too afraid to actually take the promised land. Uh, and they, they keep trying to make excuses of the, the people there are too strong. They've got chariots, etc., etc. But we know that God is strong enough to take uh, these fights for them and to, to get them to win, but they're just too afraid to follow through with it. And so we talked about how to become transformed into God's nature. We need to be ready and willing to put aside the wicked influences around us. You know, so many times uh, people talk about being baptized or uh, uh, come to, to God to so that they can uh, live and uh, go to heaven and all this different stuff. But we, we seem to forget that the whole purpose of that, the whole way we actually get to God is to become transformed into his nature. It's to, to sit there and think that the baptism is the only thing that we have to do and that we don't have to change anything about ourselves is a, a real faulty way of looking at this life. And so we have to be ready to say, you know, I'm putting aside this life of the world so that I can become more like God. And so just like the people needed to be able to set aside the worldly influences around them that uh, existed because of these foreign peoples, uh, we've got to be able to do the same with the world around us. We have to be able to look at the world around us, the things about ourselves, and say, what do I need to put aside so that I can become more like God? And that when we trust in God to help us, and we're obedient to his will, we don't have to worry about anything. Uh, we don't have to worry about making these tough decisions about going into these uh, struggles and everything because we know that God will uh, have that fight for us. Uh, we saw it in the first uh, three or four uh, judges that we looked at. You know, They went into these battles and they did not uh, have any concern about doing so. Uh, the only one that did would be Barak, and he wasn't even actually listed as uh, the judge in that story, it was Deborah that was listed as the judge. And she didn't have any fear about uh, going to do what God told them to do. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, let you guys read through Judges 7. Uh, we'll pause the, the video right here. Uh, if you guys have any questions or uh, comments, you can ask those or, or state those. And then uh, we'll uh, start the video back up again uh, once uh, you guys finish that. So go ahead and pause the video and we'll go. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we are going to look at here is the fact that the cycle is repeating yet again. Uh, you know, this, this cycle in the book of Judges is something that uh, is constantly referenced because, uh, I mean, they just keep following the same ridiculous pattern over and over and over again. And so when the story of Gideon begins, we see just how bad the situation has gotten. I mean, they, they've clearly uh, rebelled against God and the, the people are being punished. But this is a, a, a whole new situation that we haven't seen yet in the book because so far it's mainly just been one uh, country coming in uh, and taking control or one country coming in and uh, trying to reestablish control like the Canaanites with, with Deborah. This is a completely different situation because this isn't just them being attacked. This isn't just you know somebody has come in and conquered them. This is a large number of people. I mean, the book specifically tells us that it's uh, the uh, Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the eastern peoples that are raiding their land. 
And so it's not even just a matter of they're coming in, they're attacking them, you know, it's it's just one massive attack that we're referencing. It's the fact that every single time that Israel starts to see a harvest, the, these people are coming in, they're settling on the land, and they're taking all of the harvest and leaving Israel with nothing. Uh, and so it's it's getting really bad for the people. Now, following the pattern of the judges, the people have rebelled, and so now they're crying out to God because they're being punished. And, and again, we see something new here, because ordinarily, so far in the story, when God's people cry out, he just provides a judge, and, and it goes from there. But this one's a little bit different, because here we see that a prophet arrives, and this prophet shows up and tells the people that God wants to remind them of some things. And God reminds them uh, of the rescue that he provided from Egypt. He reminds them of the fact that he rescued them from the people who originally lived in the land. You know, when Joshua was still there, he rescued them from all the, the different nations that they fought against first. And then even after Joshua passed, when they first got started, they were doing good, and God was delivering them in those battles. And his request for them was simple. Worship me and nobody else. And so God reminds them of what they've done. That they've not worshipped him. That they've not made him their God. That they've been following all these other different idols. And, and that's kind of where it just gets dropped right there. The conversation just kind of ends. Uh, this kind of reminds me of where uh, Abby and I are at with Hannah right now. Because uh, she'll do something that she's not supposed to do. And we kind of walk her through that process. You know, she... She does what she's not supposed to do. We, we punish her, and then uh, we circle back afterwards, and we just kind of say, okay, now what decisions did you make that led to you being punished? And, you know, sometimes she'll sit there and go, I don't know, but we just kind of press it a little bit longer, and eventually she's able to remember it, and she'll say what she did. And we're not doing this just to be mean or anything. It's that we want her to understand what the problem was so that she can develop this memory of what's causing this to happen for her and that this is something that's not acceptable. And so uh, the, the idea is to, to just help her develop that memory so that she can learn what not to do. And, and I, I think that's kind of what we see God doing here. Uh, and so even though God is upset with the people for rebelling against him, once again, we see God's love his grace and his mercy on display because once again, he's still providing a rescuer. And so uh, we we first meet Gideon on the scene and he's harvesting wheat in a wine press. Now, just in case anybody doesn't know what the what a wine press is or what it looks like, it's, it's a really big, tall, uh, uh, circular area. And what the people would do is when they got a grape harvest, they would take all the grapes and they'd dump it into the, the bin and then they'd crush it. Sometimes it would be just stomping on the grapes, or uh, sometimes it would be uh, getting a big stone in there and, and crushing it all with a big stone. But that's not what it, Midian, or Gideon is using this for. Gideon is, is actually uh, threshing his wheat inside this, this wine press because he knows that it's tall enough that he can thresh the wheat and not get caught by the Midianites. Because, see, when he's threshing the wheat, he's got that, that big fork, and he's going to sit there and toss the wheat up in the air, and then the chaff will separate, and the, the kernels will fall, and he'll be able to keep the kernels. And, and so he knows that if the Midianites see him harvesting wheat, they're going to come and they're going to take it. And so he's trying to do this in secret. And this is when the angel of God introduces himself to Gideon. He specifically says, God is with you, mighty warrior. Okay? And Gideon just gives this absolutely weak response. And it's a response that's pretty typical for the people of Gideon's day. And unfortunately, it's a response that we hear from people today as well. Because see, Gideon is looking at the world around him, and he's like, this is terrible. This is frustrating. Because we're being attacked, we're being uh, uh, harassed by all these different peoples, and you know, this is, this is just so frustrating. And God's telling me that he loves me. And so, you know, it's the same thing that we hear from people today, that the people hear that God loves them and he cares about them. And they say, well, if God loves me, if he loves all these different people, then why are all these bad things happening? Well, Gideon 
you know, goes into this accusation of God and starts saying, if God's with us, then why are we suffering right now? If God's with us, then why am I forced to harvest wheat in secret? If God's with us, why don't we have an abundant crop? Now, it's pretty bold for Gideon to accuse God while not accepting responsibility for his own issues. Uh, and, and yet God seems to just ignore this comment and, and instead gives goes on and gives Gideon a command. He says, go in the strength you have and save Israel. Now, eventually God will provide his spirit to Gideon to do these great things he's going to do. But notice what God's saying here. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you this incredible power. He tells Gideon to go in the strength he already has. Now, this seems to coincide with what God said about Gideon in verse 12, mighty warrior. God knows who we really are. Even if we don't live or act like that, God knows who we are, and he refuses to call us by anything else. Uh, our role is to accept what God made us to be and to live out that calling. Uh, growing up around comic books, I always wanted to be the superhero. Uh, you see stories in the Bible of people like David, uh, Samuel, Moses, and you want to be like them. You want to be the big superhero, the big important person. Uh, but God had plenty of normal people along the way, uh, people that we would see as just less important or whatever else, but they were just as crucial to his story as anybody else was. You know, God may call on some people to be mighty warriors, and he may call on some people to, to be uh, teachers or, or servants or, or whatever else the case may be. And, and you all are in this position in your life right now where you're starting to really think about and figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. You're starting to figure out what you're passionate about, what you're good at, what God has given you skills for. And what I want to encourage you guys, uh, again, as I've encouraged you before, is to find out those things that you're passionate about, that God has gifted you to do, and figure out how you're going to fit that into God's kingdom. How you're going to uh, answer his calling for his work as you go about this. Uh, so the next thing that we uh, see here is this uh, whole series of fear and signs. Uh, that Gideon's going to be constantly afraid, and he's going to be going back and asking for uh, these signs again and again. Uh, so Gideon's first assignment is to destroy his father's uh, Asherah pole and the altar to Baal. But Gideon's afraid, and so he does it at night when nobody's going to be looking. You know, I mean, he had God's backing, so he could have done it during the daytime, and he would have been okay, but he's afraid, and so he waits till night. The people wake up, and they see that their, their altar's destroyed, that this pole is down, and they are, they're furious about it. They, they figure out that it's Gideon, and they go up to Gideon's father, and they say, we demand that you hand him over so that he can be killed for destroying this altar. And Gideon's father is the first person that we actually see in the story with an ounce of courage. Because Gideon's father, and the, and the altar belonged to Gideon's father, but Gideon's father actually responds to these people and says, no, you're not going to kill my son. Look, if Baal is so powerful and Baal is real, then Baal can take it up when somebody destroys his altar. If Baal's really that upset and he's real, he can kill my son. You guys aren't touching him there. And so uh, this is when uh, uh, Gideon gets uh, introduced to this nickname of Jerob Baal that you're going to see throughout the story. Uh, so Gideon finally goes off and he heads off to fight the Midianites. He's still afraid and he asks God for uh, the sign of the, the fleece. And if you don't remember it, Gideon uh, is, is waiting, and he says, Okay, God, uh, I'm going to set out this fleece, and if you are going to give me this victory, then uh, let, let's make the fleece be wet in the morning, but let's make the rest of the ground around it be dry. Gideon wakes up, grabs the fleece, and he wrings it out, and there's just a ton of water in it. Now, that should have been okay, but instead Gideon says, Okay, God, you know what? Um, you know, if you really want me to uh, go out there and you're really going to be with me on this one, then let's do this one more time. I'm going to put the fleece out there again, and then in the morning, if you really want me to go out there, then let's let the, the ground be wet, and let's let the fleece be dry. Gets up the next morning, fleece is bone dry, water around it's, I mean, soaked with dew, okay? 
Now, if you go into an NIV study Bible, you might see a note where they sit there and uh, say that they connect this request to Abraham's request for Sodom and Gomorrah. This is actually going to be one of those times when I actually disagree with that idea. Uh, and, and here's why. Because in Abraham's request, God doesn't begin by telling Abraham, I'm willing to spare the city if I find some righteous people. He starts off by telling Abraham, uh, I'm going down there to inspect it, and if it's as bad as I think, I'm going to just wipe them out. And so Abraham, his questions are determining how far God's grace is going to go. Uh, and so th this is why he keeps going back down and down and down until he gets to 10. Gideon has already been told that he's going to be given this success. And he's doubting that promise and asking for further confirmation, not just once, but twice. And, and, and the other uh, the difference between these two stories here is that once God and Abraham come to the conclusion that it's going to be 10 people, Abraham doesn't, you know, hold God up before he goes over and says, no, wait a minute, it's, it's 10, right? We, we, came, we came to agree on 10, right? That, that's what we said, right? They just let it go. Abraham fully trusts God that if he wakes up in the morning and Sodom and Gomorrah is still there, that he must have seen 10 people and he just, you know, would have gone about his day. But when he wakes up in the morning and he sees that they're destroyed, he had to have said to himself, wasn't even 10 people. Wow. Gideon doesn't do this, though. He, he still doesn't seem to fully trust God because he still asks for confirmation again and again. And he's going to have this come up again in just a little bit with the Midianites when he actually arrives on the scene with them. So Gideon goes up and he starts to gather his army. And then he sees God say, nope, we're going to bring this down to 300. Because God needs the people to understand that they cannot look at this as something that they did. If there, were, uh, a, if there was a large enough army, then they would have sat there and trusted in their own ability, and it probably would have ended in, in a tragedy. But God is saying, you need to trust in me, and that I'm going to rescue you. And so he brings down the army to 300, so that the people can have to absolutely say, this was God's doing and no other. Uh, and, but the threat hasn't reduced at all. You know, it's not like the threat has gotten smaller in this process. I mean, the author specifically tells us that these these uh, invaders are, are like, there's 120,000 of them, okay? And so uh, it specifically says that there's there are locusts on the ground. Now, to Gideon's credit, we don't actually hear him make a request for another sign, but God has to sit there and tell him, look, if you're still too scared, Go up there and listen to these people, and you'll hear them having a conversation where they're actually scared of you. And so the fact that God has to suggest that, and the fact that Gideon actually follows through with that plan, shows that he's still afraid, and he's still needing these, these signs from God that he can do what he's been told to do. Now, one thing that we're going to notice as we go through the book of Judges is that it's designed with these specific events to mirror what's happening in the story of the kings, of, of Saul and David and, and the others. Because there's this direct contrast with Jonathan in 1 Samuel. See, in, in, in Jonathan's story, Saul and the Israelite army are, are going up against the Philistines. But Saul is too afraid to actually take the people into the fight, and so he's waiting. Jonathan gets bored and says to his armor bearer, he says, look, I'm tired of waiting. Let's go up there. And if we go up there and they say, you know, uh, a certain phrase, we'll take that as a sign from God that he's going to give us the victory, and we'll go up there and we'll kick some butt. Uh, but if they say this other phrase, then we'll take that as uh, God's way of saying that we need to hold back and wait. And because of Jonathan's boldness, because of his courage, his armor bearer gets encouraged as well and specifically tells him, you go do whatever you feel is right. I trust in you, and I'm going to follow you into whatever you tell me to do. This is in direct contrast to Gideon, who's so afraid that he has to go up there and hear from God himself. Uh, so uh, after Gideon goes in and he, and he starts attacking the Midianites and he starts chasing them off, 
uh, you know, what we see are these three separate scenes of rebellion against the judge. Uh, we, we've said this before, the people don't always do the best job of listening to their God-appointed judges. Uh, and so this one in particular starts with Ephraim, because uh, they uh, are, you know, Gideon goes into the fight, uh, he's only got 300 people, that God has, you know, narrowed it down to that many people, uh, and then afterwards, after the Midianites start running, Gideon starts calling on the rest of the people and saying, hey, I need you to to block them from being able to run away and kick them back into action. Uh, and so Ephraim does it. They do a good job of it. But afterwards, they go up to, to Gideon, and they start complaining and then saying, you know, why didn't you invite us into this fight? Now, if Gideon had been brave and smart, he would have told them, look, realistically, it didn't matter because I would have taken in a bigger army, but God told me 300. But secondly, I did call you into the fight when it was time, and you did a great job. Instead, Gideon chooses to pacify the people and, and, and instead of challenging them for their bad behavior. Now, we're actually going to see this exact scenario come up again later on in Judges with Jephthah. Uh, so Gideon, uh, you know, he's already gotten rebellion once. He's, he's pursuing the Midianites, uh, and still chasing them down to try and finish this, this battle. And he reaches two separate towns. And each time he arrives there, he gets there and he says, you know, my men are tired, we're hungry, we're thirsty. Can you give us something so that we can finish this fight? And both times these people say no. Now, as a judge, he should have been supplied with what he needed. As somebody who is trying to rescue them out of the hands of these, these Midianites and, and the invaders, he should have been taken care of. And yet they say no. You know, uh, uh, this is, uh, again, uh, got a, uh, a mirror image in, in uh, David's story because uh, this is apparently a pretty common request. You know, w we see it while David is uh, running away from Saul, and then we see it again when he's uh, trying to uh, stay alive after uh, Absalom's rebellion and the civil war that follows. Uh, and, and David takes care of these people while he's out in, in hiding. And as, as because of that taking care of them, their, their livestock, their harvest, etc., uh, you know, he just uh, eventually makes a request and says, hey, could you supply us some of the harvest? And in most cases, the people say, yeah. But we see the story of Nabal, where David has been protecting him for a while and then says, hey, can you provide us a little bit of the harvest? Uh, and he says, no. And David gets so furious that he starts marching for Nabal's house so that he can destroy everybody there. And Abigail's the only smart person smart enough between uh, Nabal and, and her to actually realize this is a terrible thing that's happened. And she races out to meet him halfway and, and catches David and says, hey, look, my husband's an idiot. Here's what you're asking for. Please don't kill us all. And David says, oh, good call, because I was about ready to do it. Okay? And so... Uh, Gideon eventually catches up with the Midianites. He grabs their kings. He drags them to both of these cities. And he says, oh, guess what? I've got them. Now you're all going to get punished. You know, it says that he goes to the people of Succoth, the first town that uh, uh, denied him help. And uh, it says he punishes them with briars and thorns. I don't know exactly what that means, but I mean, I, I imagine it's not just like small little pricks or whatever of, of a thorn. Uh, I, I I think he's got to be talking about those big, long thorns that you see in the crown of Jesus and that he must have either grabbed them and beat these people with it or thrown them into a bunch of these bushes and, and just really made them miserable. Uh, and then with Peniel, the other town that he gets rejected from, uh, he actually kills all the men of the city and then he takes this tower that they had uh, really looked up to and, and been proud of, and he destroys it. Now, uh, the last section that we're going to talk about here is uh, how uh, Gideon's sons end up just like him. So he finally uh, corners the kings, and he finally gets to a point where he's ready to execute them, and for whatever reason, he tells his son to execute them for him. But we're told in the text that he his son is just a boy, and so his son is too afraid to kill these people. 
And so the, these kings actually laugh at Gideon for it and say, you know, your son's just like you. He's a coward. Now, that doesn't end well for him because he actually does kill them. But it does show that Gideon's weakness, his fear, his cowardice is carrying into his family line. We see the last few signs of Gideon's weakness in the end of chapter 8. Uh, you know, Although he initially does the right thing because the people come up to him and they say, we want you to be our king. He, and he tells them, no, the only person who has the right to be your king is God. And for the first time in the story, you're just like, yes, Gideon's doing the right thing, only to absolutely mess it up right afterwards. See, Gideon's just won this huge fight. He's got all this uh, plunder uh, from the, the battle. David had always made a rule. When the, when the battle was over, the plunder was collected, the first part of that plunder always went to God. Gideon is not following that rule here. Gideon specifically tells the people, I want you to take some of that plunder and give it to me. And then he takes that plunder that's been given to him, and he makes an idol. I mean, this is just such a horrible way to end Gideon's story because uh, he started off his story by destroying an altar to an idol. And now at the end of his story, not only has he made an idol and Israel's worshiping this idol instead of God, but he is also not doing enough to resolve the real problem that's leading to people worshiping Baal in the first place. And so when he dies... The Baal worship just starts right back up. You know, that altar that he destroyed, it didn't do anything. And so Gideon's failures follow through his entire family. I mean, we see in chapter 8 that he uh, not only has a multitude of wives and he's got 70 uh, sons, but that uh, he's also got this concubine that he has his son through. And the rest of those sons don't like him and they kind of kick him away. Well, Abimelech is this guy's name and he eventually shows back up on the scene and tells the people, look, why should you be ruled by all 70 of these people when you should be ruled by me? And so they make an agreement. They say, yeah, sure. And so Abimelech goes off and he kills all of his brothers. Only one of these guys makes it out alive. And so uh, he actually shows up when they're celebrating all these deaths. And he tells them, look, if what you did was right and just and fair then, you know what, I hope he's the best judge in the world for you. I hope he takes care of you and that you guys are happy with him and that you guys serve him well. But if what you did was wrong, and it was, and he tells them, if what you did was wrong, then I hope that this just turns absolutely horrible for you and that he destroys you. He leads to your absolute death. And so eventually the people get, get tired of him just as much. And Abimelech starts running his mouth off, and he's in this town, and he's talking about how he could uh, absolutely destroy this one guy and his whole army. And the guy that runs that town gets tired of Abimelech running his mouth and calls on the person and says, Hey, Abimelech's here in my town. He's saying that he could defeat you. Why don't you go ahead and show up and teach him a lesson? And so this bitter fight breaks out between all these different people. And it eventually ends where Abimelech uh, chases a bunch of people into this tower. And rather than trying to wait, uh, rather than trying to go in there and, and kill him himself, he just starts taking all these branches and he puts them against the base of the, the tower and he just he decides if they're not going to come out, I'll burn them out. Well, Abimelech's story ends because a woman at the top of the tower finally feels like she's had enough of this. And she grabs a big stone and drops it from the top of the tower and hits him right on the head. And Abimelech is sitting there, somehow still aware enough to sit there and, and notice that not only it was the woman that, that did this, but that he's dying. And he says, quick, quick, somebody kill me. Somebody run your sword through me so that nobody can say that a woman killed me which is absolutely hysterical because that's exactly what we do end up knowing about Abimelech in the end of the story anyways. <laughs> and so we just see this absolute failure of Gideon because he is just too weak to do what needs to be done. And so the, the message for this week is that as followers of God, 
We need to be bold in what he asks us to do so that we can serve him best. So uh, that's all for this week. Love you guys. Look forward to seeing you again.